Hello again, everybody. My name is Mike Petralia. It's episode 233 of Patriots Beat on the CLNS Media Network. You can find us at our new website, www.clnsmedia.com. Follow us on Twitter at Patriots CLNS and at CLNS Media. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash CLNS Media. All right, it is my pleasure to welcome to the post-Super Bowl edition of Patriots Beat. The one and only Jim McBride does an outstanding job covering the Patriots for the Boston Globe. Jim, welcome to the program. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad you had me. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate that we don't have a lot to talk about after the Super Bowl, huh? Yeah, I know. What a what a, what a way to get into the off season. It's almost uh, it's almost like it hasn't hasn't stopped at all for us. You know, always, always something with this team. Always news. Literally, always something with this team, and it's like you can't even take a deep breath. Certainly, this franchise has been through this before, and you know that uh, as well as anybody. Um, certainly, uh, going back to the end of uh, Super Bowl Thirty One and. Uh, Bill Parcells leaving and the way he left. Um, you know, this team has been through controversy uh, and, you know, a lot of turbulence before uh, after Super Bowl losses. And this is just another example. But certainly I think uh, it's fresh on everybody's mind. Let's get to the first first point of contention that a lot of fans have with what happened in Super Bowl 52, uh, and that is... Malcolm Butler being benched. You and I were in the press box, and uh, we were a couple of aisles separated. But when I saw Malcolm Butler uh, not start the game, I wasn't shocked. But I was, you know, my eyebrows were raised a little bit. Then I saw him doing jumping jacks and uh, all these calisthenics on the sideline, trying to keep himself warm. I'm like, well, he, he was sick, but he's clearly not sick. And then it became obvious Belichick didn't want to use him. Your read on on how that whole story unfolded uh, when when you were watching the game live? Yeah, uh, very similar to your take. You know, when he didn't start, uh, I thought it might have had something to do with you know his being sick and, and maybe missing some practice time, or or maybe even not even be able to participate in practice fully. And uh, I thought you know it, it might have been a situation where, hey, we're gonna we're gonna hold him out for the first series. And of course, uh, you know that that went by, and then you're thinking, all right, maybe it's the first quarter, uh, and then that went by, and then you're thinking maybe it's the first half, and that went by, uh, and certainly we all thought, okay. I mean, I remember looking around at my colleagues and saying, okay, well, he comes out and starts the the second half, right after after what happened in the first half. Um, you know, they had their struggles in the secondary and on defense in general, uh, and when he didn't uh, come out and start the second half, you know. Um, we just kind of looked at each other. He's definitely not playing in this game, and it was kind of strange. You know, I was getting texts from uh, family members and 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 friends uh, wanting to know the inside scoop, and you know, it's uh, just said, "Look, if I had the inside scoop on this one, I'd I'd be telling everybody. I'd be tweeting it out." But I just I just don't know why he's not in there. And you know, obviously, like you said, he was doing calisthenics, so there was nothing physically uh, wrong with him. He played on uh, you know a punt uh, team punt uh, return, one snap, right. so you know. Yeah, punt return. So he clearly um, was 100% healthy. Um, so, you know, it remains kind of a mystery as to why he didn't, other than, you know, we know it wasn't disciplinary because that's what uh, Coach Belichick said after the game. And, you know, I have had sources who have confirmed that. So it's, it's, it's a strange, it's, it's the $64,000 question of the Super Bowl for sure. Well, and, you know, when you take a look at the way the game unfolded, And there are people who have said that Bill Belichick can be one of the most stubborn people, for better and for worse, uh, that there is in the game of football and in in certainly in in the uh, uh, business of coaching. And he was going to make his point, whatever that point was going to be, like he didn't like the way Butler was approaching practice, he didn't like the, the way he looked, whatever it was. But when you saw early in the game how I thought this, I don't want to say disorganized, how mismatched they were in the secondary. It was obvious that when they had Eric Rowe start the game on Alshon Jeffrey, that was a bad mismatch. And I'm, you know, and I can't imagine that they didn't think right away that, um, 
you know, that uh, Stefan Gilmore wouldn't have been better just trailing Jeffrey all over the place if their initial intent was we're not going to have Malcolm play this game, right? I mean, it wasn't that your kind of your feel there? Yeah, because even, even if Malcolm had started, I would have expected, you know, um, Stefan to be on Al- Sean Jeffrey and just kind of, you know, cover him all night. Um, you know, obviously that's what happened in the second half, and, you know, he did a great job covering him. But, right. Uh, yeah, it didn't make sense. They, they never looked... Uh, they never looked comfortable on defense, uh, really, throughout the whole game. I mean, Patrick Chung has played the slot plenty of times, but to ask him to play it the whole game was strange. Um, you know, so it really took them it took them out of their comfort zone. Um, it, you know, if you wanted to, you know, just match Gilmore up with Jeffrey and, and give Rowe whoever's on the opposite side, that would have made more sense to me. But, uh, yeah, it, it, they just never looked comfortable, and it, it really harkened back to those first, four weeks of the season when when uh, people didn't, I, I, like you said, I don't want to say confused, but they just didn't look comfortable in their roles. And people were kind of looking around at each other at the last second before the snap, like, am I, am I where I'm supposed to be? Uh, which was very uncharacteristic of this defense, say, the last 11 games of the season when, you know, they gave up their yards, but when push came to shove, they, they, they didn't give up many points. Well, the other thing that that I think people forget in this game is when you put Patrick Chung in the slot, you're not allowing him to cover, for the most part, Zach Ertz. And I, when I looked up a couple of times and saw Jordan Richards uh, matched up against Zach Ertz, I'm like, what? How how was that going to be in the Patriots' favor based on the rotations and the domino effect that you know Ben Volan, your colleague, uh, broke down in film? Uh, in this film review, how, how does that help the Patriots? And that's what, to me, Jim, doesn't make sense about this whatsoever. Because if we see that, you know Bill sees it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the second half adjustments, you know, some of them came, but certainly not enough of them came. And, you know, Jordan Richards struggled mightily uh, covering Zach Ertz. And as we know, um, you know, and even in my scouting report for Sunday's paper for that game, I had one of my key matchups was Patrick Chung against Zach Ertz because, Right. You know, Patrick has excelled at covering tight ends and, you know, faces Gronk an awful lot in practice. And if there's a, if there's a defensive back in this league that can cover tight ends, it's, it's Patrick Chung, uh, because he's so strong for his size and, you know, he's got decent quickness. But when you ask him to start covering slot receivers for an entire game, um, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of weakening him. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, we all understand that Bill Belichick is the most accomplished coach in the Super Bowl era, certainly, and I would make the argument he's the most accomplished head coach in NFL history based on the free agency era and how he's built his rosters, how he's drafted, how he's developed players to fit a particular style and then have him excel in that style and then have his assistant coaches uh, not only uh, execute the game plan but also carry on uh, that approach. And to me... This none of this made sense on Sunday. It was like uh, he I hate to say outthink he he outsmarted himself, but it looks like he outsmarted himself. Yeah, I would totally agree with your character characterization of of, of Bill as the, as the greatest you know coach in, in in NFL history. There's no question. But yeah, it almost looked like they had a plan in place and uh, they were going to stick with it until it turned around, and you know it just never did. Um, and that it was, like I said before, it was so reminiscent of those first four games where, you know, people were trying to figure out their roles. And, um, you know, I don't know when the, the game plan was completely implemented, um, but, you know, it just it, it just didn't work. It just it just flat out didn't work. You know, um, they only forced one punt the whole game, which was kind of ironic that the Patriots never punted and still lost the game. So, yeah, it was. It was kind of a, a discombobulated situation on the field and, and, and for us in the press box, too, because we just didn't know what was going on. Where does he wind up? I mean, obviously, the assumption is Malcolm Butler isn't coming back to New England. He's probably, um, you know, going to sign somewhere else. And I'm just curious from you. I mean, there are people who would certainly think New Orleans, uh, because that almost happened last year, would be a logical landing spot. Detroit could happen uh, because of... Um, Matt Patricia taking on the head job there, uh, but that may or may not be a slam dunk. What What do you think, uh, Jim, early on here before we hit free agency? 
those would definitely be my top two choices. Uh, I also think that that uh, Texans would be, you know, uh, that they need a they need a corner, they need help on defense. That could be a possibility. But you know, he uh, we, when we talked to Sean Payton at the owners' meetings, he he really liked uh, Malcolm um, and talked about him. You know, they weren't able to, to reach out a deal, but he, he really liked them. So I think that that gets revisited because the teams couldn't work out a trade. And you know, he's he's from. Um, you know, he's from Vicksburg, Mississippi, which isn't far from New Orleans, so it, it would kind of be like going home to him. But uh, like you said, Detroit's an option because of his familiarity with Matty, uh, Matty P. And I know that, uh, you know, the Texans have have, uh, have, have had a need at cornerback, and, you know, Bill O'Brien has ties to the Patriots, so he knows. And he's seen Malcolm, you know, up close in three games the last three years in, in those uh, joint practices, so he knows what he's getting. Um, so I, I think those would be the three top teams that I would uh, I would I would put. And certainly Texans receiver uh, DeAndre Hopkins showing off his mad Photoshop skills on Tuesday uh, made a pitch <laughs> for uh, Malcolm yeah. Butler. I, I thought that was a pretty uh, classy move. I thought that was pretty creative on uh, DeAndre's part. No. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he, he would kind of be a uh, you know an iron shop and iron iron kind of deal for him because he'd get to go against Malcolm in practice and. You know, DeAndre's probably in the top. Maybe, maybe only Antonio Brown is better than him in the league, in my opinion. So, you know, if he says if he wants Malcolm Butler, then he, you know, he has a tremendous amount of respect for him. Speaking with the uh, terrific Jim McBride, Patriots beat reporter for the Boston Globe, have to tell you guys about my newest time-saving trick. I got my contact lens prescription for my daughter, Janie, renewed for my couch just two weeks ago, and I did it in under five minutes using an awesome new app called Simple Contacts. Simple Contacts lets you renew your prescription and reorder your brand of lenses from anywhere in minutes through an online vision test or if you have an existing prescription. It's designed by doctors, and every test is reviewed by a doctor, so they're literally bringing the doctor's office right to your home. The contact lens prices are unbeatable. The vision test is only $20, and shipping is free. Best of all, my listeners get $30 off their first Simple Contacts order with my promo code TRAGS. This is not a replacement for an eye exam, they want you to know that. But again, try it for yourself and save $30 on your lenses by going to simplecontacts.com using the backslash code TRAGS or just enter the code TRAGS at checkout. Again, that's simplecontacts.com slash TRAGS or just enter my uh, the code TRAGS, T-R-A-G-S, at checkout. Again, speaking with Jim McBride of the Boston Globe covering the New England Patriots for the Boston Globe, and I want to move on to some other subjects because, oh, by the way, the Patriots are getting back their offensive coordinator after we thought for the last three weeks or so Josh McDaniels was all but gone for Indianapolis. Um, Your level of surprise or shock when you heard the uh, or saw the first tweet from Adam Schefter that Josh McDaniels was turning down the Colts on Tuesday night, Jim? Pretty job dropping, Greg. You know, I mean, I stepped off the plane yesterday from Minneapolis and um, immediately wrote a story about uh, <laughs> you know Josh taking the job because the uh, the Colts had had made the announcement. Uh, you know, I thought that there was, you know, uh, it, it was strange that he didn't want to talk about that after the Super Bowl. I did too. But then I thought, you know, it's it's right uh, it's right after you know the emotion of the game. Maybe you know maybe that's the reason why. So. Um, there was maybe a, a seed of doubt in my head uh, at that point, but then when I saw the tweet from the Colts on on Tuesday, I said, "Okay, well, that was crazy of me to think that." And then um, about uh, later on in the afternoon, I thought, uh, "Well, I was crazy to think that I was crazy because, lo and behold, Josh was coming back, and you know, I had to write a whole new story." So probably, uh, you know, the range of emotions that we went through were probably not quite as what he went through, but but still pretty. Pretty a pretty uh, big surprise that that uh, that he's still going to be the offensive coordinator of the Patriots after yeah. it looked like it was a uh, locked in to be the uh, next Colts coach. As I always tell my daughter Janie when she's taking an exam, always trust your first instinct, Jim. Always go with your gut. That's all I can tell you about that instinct. You know, and I you know. Look like. A- <laughs> I would have looked like a genius on this one had I done that. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure you would have. And I, I know as much as anybody that you are very, very, very good at your job. And uh, I would have taken your word and I would have taken your judgment on that. And, you know, I, I was in that 
um, staging area, they like to call it after the Super Bowl, um, where they bring all of the star players uh, and the coaches in there. And he just didn't look um, when, when it was a, when the question was asked. He almost had a faraway, um, disengaged reaction to the question, which is. You know, like you said, he's trying to just talk about the the game that just ended, and he doesn't want this to come across as selfish or what have you. That he, oh, great, I'm I'm moving on to a my second head coaching job. It, it wasn't that. It just looked like he was a little bit disengaged. Now, you saw the Chris Ballard news conference today, Jim. What did you think? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I think that he was he was probably sh- uh, not only shocked and but probably a little hurt because I, I'm sure he thought he had his his guy in place. And, and, and one other thing before I address that, like, it's funny, like people had asked me about the, about Josh's reaction on Sunday night. And then they said, well, what was Matt Patricia like when they asked him if he was definitely taking the Detroit job? And I don't think anyone even asked him because he was so peppered with Malcolm questions that, um, by the time he had left, no one had really asked him about, Hey, you definitely taking the lion's job. So it was kind of, I didn't have a point of reference to compare his reaction to Josh's. But, right. Uh, yeah, it was it was um, you know the ballot press conference today. I thought was um, you know clearly uh, clearly they were hurt. You know the fact that he that he didn't want to hear Josh's reason for for doing it. He just wanted yes or no. Like he didn't uh, you know. So clearly they were they were hurt and they wanted to move on quickly. I found it interesting the, the mic drop moment at the end there when yeah. he said you know the rivalry is back on. That was that was kind of funny and that's kind of going to kind of make for a great week when. Um, when the Colts come to Foxborough next year, I mean, that, um, that's going to be brought up again. And, uh, you know, Josh is going to face questions about it. And, you know, maybe, maybe he reveals more of his, his answers because I don't, I don't know that we'll get any, um, anytime soon about, you know, exactly what range of emotions he went through to, to change his mind. He really is not going to have to talk. I don't think until perhaps, um, the mini camp, uh, if the team is forced to make them, you know, the assistance available then, or perhaps in training camp. Um, so it's going to be a while before we hear uh, from Josh McDaniels, at, you know, at least in front of all of us as a group of reporters. But, you know, before we, you know, talk specifically about Chris Ballard, let's go back uh, 24 hours and acknowledge the meeting, the 12 to 14 hours worth of meetings between Josh McDaniels, Robert Kraft, and Bill Belichick. And um, your gist and your understanding of what that meeting was all about. Yeah, I think it was, uh, you know, I think that there was obviously uh, mutual interest in, in getting this done. I think that, um, you know, uh, Mr. Kraft probably went to Josh and it might have been even, hey, this is, you know, a goodbye thing. And, you know, he, maybe he sensed the fact that, that Josh wasn't all in on the Colts and, and uh, you know, decided to, to have a conversation about it, um, sweeten the pot maybe. Uh, I know my sources tell me that Josh wasn't given any assurances that, you know, he's the heir apparent when, when Bill decides to leave. But I'm sure he was given some kind of, you know, encouragement that, you know, you'll be, you'll be near the top of the list for consideration, especially if the successful run that the offense um, has been on for these last, you know, 10 years um, continues, then I think that, you know, he'll, he'll be given every consideration in the world. But, you know, things happen. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the familial ties that he has in this area uh, were important to him. And I don't think it was a great experience he had in Denver, and then he was in St. Louis for a year. And I just don't think he wanted to uproot his family unless he felt like he was all in on something. And, you know, clearly now um, he wasn't. Well, and the other thing, uh, Jim, that I, I've told other people that I very much believe this, don't discount the Tom Brady factor in all of this, because who is Josh McDaniel's closest confidant on the team? It's Tom, right? And, you know, we've seen Absolutely. it. And Tom versus Time, the two of them talking uh, on their way to the Carolina game, I believe it was, in week four, and going over plays. And I just feel, I get the sense, as close as Tom and Robert Kraft are, that Tom got into Robert Kraft's ear. And I don't know this to be the case, but I certainly think it would make sense. And said, hey, can we make one last ditch effort at bringing Josh back because I only have so many more years and I, instead of making a transition at the age of 41 to a new 
uh, offensive coordinator, even if that offensive coordinator is Chad O'Shea, I would rather just stick with Josh. Yeah, I certainly think that's a plausible, uh, you know, scenario, uh, Trags. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, Tom and, and Josh, despite what everyone wants to, you know, make a big deal about their, their heated exchange in, um, in Buffalo, yeah. they're close. They, they, you know, they've, they've each said that they love each other like a brother. And I think that's the kind of relationship they have. You know, they're going to, they're going to have arguments and disagreements because they both want the same thing, basically perfection. Um, but yeah, the relationship is very, uh, very close. Uh, I think they, you know, I think that they're not just, you know, coach quarterback, they're, they're friends, they're, you know, not far apart in age at all. So I just think they're very close. And I think that's a very possible situation that he, that he went to Mr. Kraft and said, look, I, I don't want to lose Josh. And if there's any possible way that we can keep him, um, let's do it. I, I, yeah, I just think that makes too much sense for that, for that not to have played uh, a factor. Okay. Bill Belichick meeting with Robert Kraft and Tom Brady. A, does that happen? And B, if it does, what is the end result? Uh, if it happened already, or if it's no? Do you think? Do you think it's going to happen? Um, as you know, has been reported, as has been suggested that the the three are going to. Uh, I believe Ian Rappaport was the latest to say that something is going to happen between the three of them. The get together, if they indeed sit down uh, as a group, what do you think is the result? I think that it's probably more standard operating procedure than anything that that, that the three of them would would get together in the off season, and maybe they're doing it this time because of you know all the the the, the Alex Guerrero stories and and the you know the, the Seth Wickersham uh, report, and maybe they maybe they want to clear the air, but I really don't think that the the problems are are as you know dire as everyone says, or, or that even that Seth story made it out to be. I think it was the fact that there's, you know, three guys that, uh, you know, don't always see eye to eye, but they work together just like any other company or, or workplace. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you, you can't get the job done, you know. So, so maybe it's just one of those clear the air type meetings um, and they address, you know, points that were brought up in that story, you know. Uh, but I don't think it's very – I don't think it's odd or strange that they're, they're getting together um, and having a meeting. I, I think that they probably do that um, – you know, on a pretty consistent basis, especially in the off season when they have the time. I, I would agree with that, Jim. The only thing I would say, though, is if, if it's true that Robert Kraft did not have any idea of what Belichick was doing uh, and didn't get any explanation beyond it was just my coach's decision on Malcolm Butler, I would tend to think that it adds another element of intrigue if those three get together, don't you think? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, if, the, if that, if that is the case, then maybe it's just, um, you know, Kraft wanting to say, Hey, what, what went into the decision? Was it, you know, was it, th- was it X, Y, or Z? And certainly as an owner, he has every right to do that. Uh, you know, I, I don't think his, you know, I don't think his trust level in bill would, would waver at all, uh, or, or, you know, his confidence in him, but maybe he just wants to know what went into that decision. Okay, how much of an impact will um, Dwayne the Rock Johnson and Sly Stallone have on the future <laughs> of the Patriots' offense? Uh, well, I hope none. <laughs> from you know, from a selfish perspective, because you know it's, it's fun to cover Rob Gronkowski, and uh, he's a fun guy to be around, and he's a fun guy to watch. It's like watching, you know, we could be watching the you know, the, the best player in the history of, of football at that position. Uh, we already get to do it with Tom, um, but I think Gronkowski is kind of a, a different animal at that tight end position like like we've never seen before, and I would hate to see his uh, his career end for um, <laughs> for a, a chance at Hollywood. I mean, I've seen some of his acting, and uh, he needs some yeah, work there. <laughs> yeah, he, he does. He, there's no question about that, but... Um, you know, there's acting and then there's charisma, and Hollywood can sell charisma just as well as it can sell acting. My 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 whole thing here, uh, Jim, is twofold. I think it is health related. I think the last concussion started him thinking seriously about his future. He's got he's had the three back surgeries. He's had the forearm. Um, he's had um, obviously the knee injury, the ACL, and 
I just think he's wondering what kind of quality of life is he going to have, not when he's 40, when he's 30, 35. And um, yes. I think that is crossing his mind, and I think he is – I don't think this is a passing – you know, fancy of, hey, I'm just going to mess around with you guys and say uh, I'm I'm going to look at retiring. But the other thing is I do think he wants to be paid. If he's coming back, I think he wants to be – I think he wants to receive what he thinks is fair and just for what he's contributed and the way he's sacrificed his body. Yeah, I think that's, that's the latter is probably the uh, more logical uh, scenario that he – his contract gets restructured or torn up and they have a whole new contract for him. Um, you know, clearly he deserves it. And, you know, that's, that's definitely on his mind. He has had a lot of wear and tear. I think the, I think the retirement comments were, were laid out there, but it, he was also, um, it was in the heat of the moment, the emotional uh, aftermath of, of, of losing that Super Bowl. Um, but I have to believe that he still wants to play and that, um, you know, I think that, I think that an acting career can be there uh, even after a couple more years. And so I, I think he still has a couple more years in him. I think he'd like to play at least as long as Tom's still playing and, you know, then maybe, then maybe get out of Dodge. You know, that, that, I'd like that theory as much as any other, uh, Jim. I, I think, you know, obviously the story got legs when Mike Florio during the Super Bowl threw out that tweet. And I think it got everybody kind of going, really? Where's that? Well, and then obviously Florio and the relationship with Drew Rosenhaus, who is Gronk's agent. I mean, everybody puts, you know, one and one and one together and comes up with three and connect the dots and all of that. And that's probably where a lot of that came from. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, you know, they, they he, he does get a lot of, you know, they do have a, a good relationship. And, um, you know, Florio's a, a pretty reliable source, so. Um, you know, when you see that out there, you have to take it seriously. All right. What's your uh, time going to be? Are you going to be able to catch your breath now that you've uh, written about Josh McDaniels, Matt Patricia, Bill Belichick, Malcolm Butler, Rob Gronkowski? Are you going to be able to get yourself uh, any type of break here coming up? I, I hope so. You know, I did, I did a story today about, uh, you know, the pending free agents, the, the, the top priorities, uh, you know, the Patriots have 15 free agents and, you know, what might happen with them, but uh, might do like a future roster breakdown, but then I'm going to take some time off and, you know, kind of dig into the draft right before the combine. But yeah, definitely, um, you know, won't be, won't be making that trip down route one um, anytime soon. So that's good. Well, uh, if anybody's uh, deserved uh, some time off, it is you, Jim McBride. Uh, follow you uh, on Twitter. How can people do it? Uh, at Globe Jim McBride, and I appreciate those comments from the the man I consider the hottest working guy in yeah. our in this Boston market, and you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jim. You didn't have to say that, but that is very kind of you. And uh, obviously, people can follow you uh, at Boston Globe um, at the Boston Globe dot com. Correct. Absolutely. Yep, I'll be there. All right, stay with CLNS all day on game days starting in 2018 with the CLNS Media New England Patriots pregame show. That's with Alex Barth, and that's a half hour before every game. Then you can catch the postgame show, as was the case in 2017, with Marvin Ezon and Mike Molino live after every single game on clnsmedia.com. Subscribe to both on iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube now. You can also go back and listen to old episodes. Also get daily team updates on the Patriots Newsfeed podcast with Tyler Trudeau, which is also available on the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show feed, available once again on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and the CLNS Media mobile app. Thanks again for downloading today's Patriots Beat. want to once again thank our terrific guest, Jim McBride from the Boston Globe. You can follow him again on Twitter at Globe Jim McBride. You can also give us a follow at Patriots underscore Beat, at Patriots CLNS, and at CLNS Media. You can also give my own personal account a follow at Trags, T-R-A-G-S. Today's sponsor with Simple Contacts. For Patriots content manager Michael Angi, CLNS media executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of the network Nick Gelso, thanks to everyone who tuned in. This is Mike Petralia, and this is the Patriots Beat Podcast, powered by CLNS Media. 
What's going on, Pass Nation? This is Marvin Zone of the CLNS Media Network, and I'm here to tell you right now to check out the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show hosted by myself and my co-host, Mr. Mike Nice. And we're live on CLNS Radio immediately after every single pass game. Call in at 929-477-2386 toll-free to get your voice heard and contribute to the host breakdown and analysis of the latest Patriots contest. We also got the stars and sorries of the day, Twitter posts for the plays of the game, and everything else that is going on with the five-time Super Bowl champion. Subscribe to CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show on iTunes and Stitcher. And the best way, download the free CLNS Media Network mobile app for on-demand listening anytime, anyplace, anywhere. 